Department and Presidential Library. To kick off today's meeting, I'd like for Becky Finney to lead us in the four-way test, prayer, and pledge. Good afternoon, Rotarians. Would you uh, join me in stating the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do? Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And now please join me uh, in prayer. Creator and sustainer of all, accept our thanks for this day and its blessings. We ask that you lead and guide us in all of our actions. Grant that we each may feel our responsibility for peace on earth. Keep us ever mindful of opportunities to render our service to fellow citizens, our community, and this world. <clears throat> may we be challenged to give our very best, and may we be assured your presence is with us. Bless the food to the nourishment of our bodies. Amen. And now if you join me in the pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Uh, I'd like to thank our greeters, uh, Chad Brown, uh, Rick Fleetwood, Kim Kirkman, J.D. Lowry. Thanks as always to Greg McCarroll. Uh, next, I'd like for Pam Smith to introduce our guests, followed by a new member introduction from Molly McNulty. Pam? Welcome. Thank you, President Peacock. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great day to be a Rotarian. I always bring excitement wherever I go, so don't mind me. <laughs> At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our special guest today. We would ask that you please hold your applause until all are introduced. Representing Rotaract, Blake Abston, please stand. Also, Caleb Bird, representing Rotaract. Roger Pratt is from the Tri-Valley California Club, and we are excited to have him back again. He's back by popular demand because he just loves hanging out with us. We also have special guests that include Laura Farrar, guest of Chris Bond, Wesley Brown, program guest, Jeff Overson. Did I get that right? Thank you. Uh, guest of Ed Levy, Laura Nick. Actually, Guy Choate is the guest of Laura Nick. Rosie Smith, guest of Katherine Young. Nikki Courtney, guest of Chad Brown. And the following are all guests of Jesse Wilson, Leanne Parham, Meg Sinha, and Britton Kinzer. Would you please give our guest a warm rotary welcome? Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm so pleased to introduce our newest Rotarian, who needs no introduction to many of you. I was going to say lawyers, but then District Governor David Mann said, no, she knows everybody in this room, legal community or not. So if our newest member, um, Terry Hollingsworth, would join us at the front along with her sponsors, District Governor David Mins and Club 99er Becky Finney. Terry was elected on November 6, 2018 to a four-year term as the circuit and county clerk of Pulaski County. Sworn in on January 1, 2019, she made history as the first African-American woman elected to a Pulaski County-wide executive position. Terry has worked in management positions in both the public and private sector and among many nonprofit organizations. 
She has served in all levels of government and began her career working for the city of Little Rock as a city planner and later as the economic development administrator. She has also worked for Arkansas Secretary of State Sharon Priest and was the director of the State Board of Election Commissioners. After serving as the Chief Administrative Officer at the Delta Regional Authority, Terry remains an active member of the Delta Leadership Network, which supports the DRA's work in eight states and the efforts of the Delta Leadership Institute. She is a member of Jack and Jill of America Incorporated, Lynx Incorporated, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and is on the board of Audubon, Arkansas. A graduate of Howard University in Washington, D.C., she earned a Master's of Business Administration from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Terry and her son Joshua Davis are members of Second Baptist Church. Terry, and I quote, has a love of golf, but golf don't love her back. <laughs> Please help me give a warm rotary welcome to Madam Clerk Terry Hollingsworth. Thank you, Pam. Uh, thanks, Molly. And of, of course, congrats to Madam Clerk. Great having you in Club 99. She told me earlier, she said, I've been planning on doing this for a long time, but it finally got over the hump. So we're glad, great having you here. And you have kept our new member street going. Anybody want to gather to make a guess where we are? 42 consecutive meetings. Let's keep it going, y'all. All right, what an amazing night we had celebrating our Ottenheimer 75th anniversary celebration last week at the Arkansas Museum of Fine Arts. Thanks so much to our committee chairs, co-chairs T. Martin Davis and Cindy Van Vekhoven, our gala coordinator, Jana Cohen, and then several who helped out with the event, Chris Mangum, Ross Al Young, Karen Fetzer, Rodney Block, Mike Marquez, Jay Cranford and Cranford Co., Baptist Health, the McCarty Companies, and our amazing Ottenheimer Committee many of whom helped sponsor the event. It's incredible. Thank you so much for all of you for making a difference and allowing us to do that really fun event. And if you missed it, I'm sorry, it was really incredible. Uh, so thank you to all of you for making it a special evening. But you can watch the 30 minute version of the 75th anniversary video. Um, it's on our website. It's been pushed out through our social media channels. And a special thanks to Chris Cranford of Cranford Co. for pulling that video together. Obviously, special thanks to T. Martin as well for his help in coordinating all the interviews. Uh, Congressman French Hill, uh, past president of the club, and Mayor Frank Scott, as well as several others, are featured prominently in this video. It's really cool, and I highly recommend everybody check it out to learn a lot more about this really special program we have here at Club 99. Uh, there's no other club that does anything like this that I know of. It's really special. Uh, next week, we will honor the Little Rock Nine with the inaugural La Petite Roche Global Service Award. At least five, possibly six, of the Little Rock Nine will be right here next week in person at the Clinton Center. The other two or three will join us virtually um, through the setup we're gonna have here, here at the uh, Clinton Library. But here's the thing, we're gonna start early. So please plan on getting here around 11-ish, uh, go through the buffet line. We will kick off our meeting at 1145 sharp. We wanna make sure that we have the full hour, roughly from 12 to one for the Little Rock Nine to be on stage and to share their experiences and kind of have the opportunity to talk to all of us about this uh, special award that we're gonna be giving them. Uh, special thanks to the City of Little Rock, Downtown Partnership, Little Rock CVB, uh, again, Baptist Health and the McCarty Companies for helping us make this event gonna be a really special opportunity to honor them with this incredible new award. The other catch, and this is real important, I hope everybody hears this, you must RSVP, we have to have your RSVP, you will look for, please look out for an email from Karen 
hopefully later today. Uh, we only have about 160 spots for Rotarians, uh, so this room's gonna be fully packed uh, by the time we take care of a few of the sponsors and the Little Rock Dine and their family members. We wanna have enough room for all of you and all of us. So sign up for Rotarians through Thursday, and then after that, we'll know how many spots we have for guests, and then be on the lookout for an opportunity to sign up for guests starting as early as Friday uh, leading up until next Tuesday. So uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to me or Karen or Lel, but all that will be available online. That's the quickest way to find out if you got confirmation or not for you and later your guests. We do wanna make sure we have a special opportunity to honor them, so please uh, be on the lookout for that. And we don't want anybody embarrassed showing up going, well, I didn't know about it. So please spread the word. Let's make sure that all our Rotarians are signing up for this special event next Tuesday. Uh, next, we have a really cool service project coming up this Saturday. For those of you who didn't get to help paint, prep the lockers at Dunbar Middle School a couple years ago, guess what? This Saturday, you'll have your chance to help us do that. It's gonna be a really fun service day, uh, be a half day, and I'd like for, let's see, where's Dan and Quentin? Are you okay? Dan and Parker and Quentin Kane, the principal of Dunbar, please come up and share a little bit more about this special service opportunity. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, uh, standing here as principal of Dunbar Madden Middle School, I want to first just thank um, the Rotary Club for their support of Dunbar. I mean, the amount of things that we've been able to accomplish this year. Um, Mr. Parker right here between uh, our back to school bash to uh, mentorships to all the great things that have been provided to our teachers and staff from the Rotary Club. We just can't say thank you enough for your help and support um, at Dunbar. Uh, the other thing is I'm excited about Saturday because again, this is my first year back at Dunbar as principal, so I'll get an opportunity to paint some lockers and, and participate in that particular end. So I'm looking forward to seeing as many of you all as can possibly come out and help us out with that. But again, thank you so much for your help, your support. Um, mentoring, I mean, hey, I, I think we were just talking about this just a minute ago. The kids, they really do love when their mentors come in. I have several come to my office when they don't see their mentor. So we're just so thankful and grateful for everything that the Rotary Club does for Dunbar. Thank you, Principal Kane. And, and uh, a, a special note, you don't have to paint. <laughs> All we're, we're going to be doing is prepping. We're going to be taping off the lockers, putting down some plastic with some tape. But Serta Pro is going to come in Monday and paint the lockers while we're all gone. So we don't have to worry about fumes or anything of that nature. But it is, will be from 8 to noon on Saturday. Um, Kathy asked me earlier if she could come by for just two hours because she had a conflict. I said, any amount of time you want to sign up and come back and participate, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Don Cole is bringing his chill and grill, and he's going to make us some uh, some food to eat after all. There he is, right there, Mister. Um, uh, the he's the only in the history of uh, the Rotary Club 99 grill master to be uh, certified. So uh, he'll be there uh, slinging some uh, some dogs and burgers or whatever he decides to bring. We've got about 10 signed up so far. Uh, we need 10 more, and we'll get through it, uh, before four, we're there for four hours, I believe. We're, we'll be up on the third floor. Mm -hmm. If you've got a little hand electric sander and, electric, and uh, an extension cord, bring that. Helps things go by faster. Uh, we're looking forward to it. If um, you've got family members or kids home from college that want to serve, feel free to bring them. It's not limited to just Rotarians. It's limited to anybody that has that. Uh, service above self, spirit in their heart. Thank you. Thanks to both of you and congrats on your uh, first year at Dunbar, Quentin. Um, our monthly board meeting will meet next after this meeting at the Clinton School. Thank you again, Dean Vicky, for allowing us to do that each month. Uh, it's at 1.15 start time. If you're part of the Ottenheimer Committee or would like to be, 
Uh, should be a, a really engaging conversation today about future countries. Uh, join that committee immediately after here in this room in the Great Hall. During our La Petite Rose Tricentennial, I will spend my year as president telling unique stories about our region's past 300 years. With today's program on Arkansas's aerospace and defense industry, it only seemed appropriate to tell the story of the Little Rock Arsenal in what is now Little Rock's first city park and named after a famous war general that was born there. Upon Arkansas becoming a state, the U.S. Department of War purchased land on the end of the city for a military installation. The arsenal was constructed in 1838 on the former site of a racetrack used by a local jockey club. Originally, Congress had allotted $14,000 for it, but the final cost was double that at 30 grand. It incorporated timbers from Palm Bluff and stone from the Big Rock on the north side of the river, as well as locally made bricks. The arsenal was unique in that it had a center tower building named for its octagon tower. And over the next decade, more than 30 buildings were added to the installation. During the Civil War, it swapped hands a couple of times. U.S. government first surrendered it to the state of Arkansas in 1861 but the Union troops would capture it back a few years later, and they would use it for housing, uh, and it would largely remain that row until 1890. In 1880, though, Captain Arthur MacArthur was stationed in the tower building when on January the 26th, his wife Mary Pinckney Hardy gave birth to Douglas MacArthur. The family only remained in Arkansas six months before the captain was reassigned to New Mexico but before departing the city, the future general was baptized at Christ Episcopal Church, a site he visited when he returned to Little Rock in 1952 for ceremonies commemorating the park in his name. MacArthur received countless awards and recognitions throughout his lifetime. He was first in his graduating class at West Point. He was one of the most highly decorated soldiers in World War I. And after a brief retirement, he returned to active duty during World War II and served as general of U.S. Army, Force, U.S. Army Forces Far East, tongue twister, and was later appointed Supreme Allied Commander of the Southwest Pacific Theater, reaching the rank of a five-star general of the Army. He accepted the surrender of Japan and served as Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers in the, corporate, in the occupation of Japan. And for those of you familiar with the USS Razorback, the submarine that's now part of the Arkansas Inland Maritime Museum, it was there as well. Later, MacArthur was made commander of United Nations forces in the Korean War before being relieved of his duties by President Truman. By 1890, with the arsenal buildings deteriorating, a deal was made in which 1,000 acres north of the river were exchanged for the site. The formal agreement of exchange stated that the property would be forever exclusively devoted to the uses and purposes of a public park. The thousand acres given in exchange became the home of what many of you know as Fort Logan H. Roots, which later was made into a veterans hospital. A firehouse was built on the southwest corner of the park in the early 1900s and was in use for four decades. Later, a fish pond was created by the Works Progress Administration which also constructed the original Museum of Fine Arts building in 1936, what we now know as the Arkansas Museum of Fine Arts. And a few years later, the Museum of Natural History and Antiquities opened in the Tower building. It had previously been located at City Hall. The museum, which changed names several times, remained there for 55 years before relocating to the River Market District and renamed the Museum of Discovery. Following its departure, the tower building was renovated and reopened in 2001 as the MacArthur Museum of Arkansas Military History. Other additions to the park over the years include a large memorial to Arkansans who served in the Korean War, a Little Rock Sister City sculpture given in appreciation for 25 years of friendship with Hanam, Korea, a renovated firehouse that opened as the firehouse hostel and museum, and of course, the newly reimagined AMFA, where we had the 75th anniversary celebration of our Ottenheimer program last week. And that's our Illuminating the Rock story for this week.
And now I'd like for Club 99er Andrew Parker of the Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce to introduce and moderate today's program on Arkansas's aerospace and defense industry. But before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit more about Andrew. <laughs> he's a licensed attorney in part of the state's, he's part of the state's chamber's governmental affairs team. He works to enhance the business climate in Arkansas by representing positions of the chamber and the Associated Industries of Arkansas Foundation. He's the executive, executive director of the AIA Foundation and has led the Be Pro, Be Proud initiative since its launch in 2016. Uh, I first got to know him when he was working with Governor Beebe and he was later appointed by the governor to the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. Andrew, thanks for being part of today's program. Welcome. Good afternoon. It's nice to be back after a short, you know, break. Uh, it is really an honor to be up here. I have had an opportunity through uh, leading the Leadership Arkansas program uh, to visit the site that we're going to be talking about today, and it really is an extraordinary place to visit. I'm not sure if it's just open to organizations and groups like leadership programs, but if you, are, if you ever get an opportunity to go to the Golden Triangle, as it's referred to, or as East Camden, where Highland Park is, it's an extraordinary tour worth visiting, and I think you're really going to enjoy what the, the panelists have to say today. So without further ado, let me introduce Chandra Hooker, John Schafitzel, and James Lee Stillman to the stage, and while they're coming on up here, I'll go ahead and give a brief uh, bio for each of them. Chandra serves as a senior director and site executive for Aerojet Rocket Dyne's Camden, Arkansas site. She's responsible for, for, for providing the people, processes, and infrastructures required to safely and successfully manufacture, test, and deliver Aerojet Rocket Dyne's products. She joined the Aerojet Rocket Dyne and the Camden team in July of 2021. John Schafitzel is the president of the Highland Industrial Park in East Camden, Highland Rail, and Highland Deep Haven. I think y'all can go ahead and sit down. We're... He's responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of Highland Resources, including the direct supervision of on-site employees serving, serving as chief negotiator on terms of leases, of leases, agreements, and is the driving force of prof profitability in real estate facility management, finance, and operation asset management. James Lee Silman is executive director of the Washita Partnership for Economic Development and the Camden Area Industrial Development Corporation. He's a lifelong resident of Camden, has served as mayor, as a board member, and on the board of directors for the Camden Area Chamber of Commerce, among many others. Please welcome them to the stage. notes that I was given, there's a common reference that you'll hear, which is, we can't talk about this, but we're going to try our best to skirt around the edge. <laughs> so let's start with James Lee. Camden received national attention last year when Politico focused on the aerospace and defense industry and the role it was playing in manufacturing rockets for, the, for Ukraine and in the war against Russia. Both Aerojet, who's here with us today, and Lockheed Martin were recognized locally as part of the Arkansas State Chamber's coolest things made in Arkansas contest. But the industry's, uh, the, the um, area's industry dates back nearly 80 years further. So would you set the table for the conversation today? Talk about the aerospace and defense industry in Arkansas, and you, can you walk us through a brief overview of that history and how we got to where we are today? Sure, be glad to. First of all, I want to thank the Little Rock Rotary Club for having us uh, as guests today. It's, it's great to be here with you. I would like to extend greetings to LR from LA. And for those of you who don't understand that, obviously LR is Little Rock, but LA is Lower Arkansas. And uh, sometimes I refer to uh, when, when I meet with a prospect that uh, uh, I'll greet them with welcome to LA, Lower Arkansas. Um, let me give you just a brief history on, on how the aerospace and defense industry got started uh, in, in the Camden area. Um, on September the, the 25th, 1944, Senator John McClellan and Represent, uh, Representative Orrin Harris announced that a $60 million Navy ordnance plant would be constructed uh, uh, near Camden. Uh, 
the area uh, to construct that, that facility, which is now Highland Industrial Park, uh, encompassed uh, over 68,000 acres uh, and 110 square miles. Uh, it required about 24,000 construction workers to build it, and uh, the, the, the estimated cost when they announced it was 60 million, but I think it actually ended up costing closer to 200 million back in, in the, the mid 40s. Um, so, you know, it, and at the time that it was constructed, it was going to be the nation's uh, number one producer, the principal rocket, ro rocket loading and uh, assembly and storage facility in the nation. And uh, so, with that said, uh, uh, we have a proud heritage and, and history uh, in the, the Camden area with what was Shoemaker Naval, Naval Ammunition Depot. And uh, so that's, that's, that's how it all began. And then uh, in, in the late uh, 50s, it was determined to be, uh, it was kind of in a slowdown uh, of production, kind of mothballed, and the government decided uh, that its services were no longer needed and they put it up for auction. And uh, John's company, uh, which is, you know, Highland Industrial, the, the Brown family, bought uh, a, a large portion of the production facilities in what was Shoemaker Naval Ammunition Depot. So that kind of gives you a brief overview of how it came about and, and the reason it was located, it straddles Washtenaw County and, and Calhoun County line. And the reason that it was constructed there was it was a generally remote area, but we had good infrastructure. We had highways, rail, and utilities and Calhoun County is the most sparsely populated county in Arkansas, still is today. And, um, but, but with that being said, it needed to be remote and uh, basically uh, the, the thinking back then was it would be hard to attack by a foreign enemy uh, because it was in the center of the United States. Um, so it, it was uh, sparsely populated and um, still is today, and <laughs> but, but we had the infrastructure in place and Senator McClellan and uh, Congressman Harris were instrumental in getting that facility built um, in our area. So that's kind of a brief history. John, do you want to just dovetail off of what he just said and give a help paint the picture of what uh, Highland Industrial Park is, what it looks like, and how it might differ from what people might think of when they think yeah, of Yeah, sure, Park. and I think we've got some slides that we were gonna pull up. Do we wanna pull those up now? There you go. <clears throat> so, you can see that there's some of the other names of the companies in the park that are major tenants there. Um, in, the, in the picture on the right, that's the uh, picture of some of our earth-covered bunkers. But if you go to that next slide, I'll, I think there's one that, Chandra, you might talk a little bit to this, to the history. But you can see across the bottom there that there's been several different uh, companies showing up there. In 1961, it shows that the Brown Engineering purchased the park. And that was kind of a key time because when they purchased the park, they purchased it for the assets to recycle them. And when James Lee talks about Governor McClellan's involvement in the, the or state and federal government, there was a time frame. It took about seven or eight years to uh, convince, I guess, the Brown family to create Highland Industrial Park. But basically, they stopped all the demolition and said, you know, these buildings, there's uh, five and a half million square foot of buildings that we manage over, it's 19,000 acres now that we have control of. But during that time frame, it was decided to use those buildings again to be able to manufacture the uh, the ordinances there because that's what they're originally designed to do. So the you know the structures are very very unique in the way they're they're built to do that. But it did take till 1979 to 81 in that time frame before there really was much energy uh, you know in, in coming there. And I've been there for about a year and a half now. And and you know our answer then was. Uh, we're full, we don't have any space, but we're kind of changing that program because we've realized we have a lot of greenfield sites and more area to develop there. So we've got some exciting times coming up ahead of us. <clears throat> Chandra, I don't know if you want to talk to some of these notes on, on the history or time frame or? Am I on? Okay. Yeah. So as you can see up there, um, as uh, John Lee already stated, it started off as the Naval Ammunition Depot. And so um, 1944 is when they had the idea that they were going to put the depot there. Um, April the 25th, 1945, they had the first building built and made the first delivery the very next day. 
if you fast forward about 45 years, uh, that's when Aerojet Rocketdyne arrived on the scene. And so it was in 1981 that we started building additional buildings so that we could do rocket motor production. And so that's just the timeline from 1945 up until about 1981. And then you fast forward, we started to do some relocation uh, product lines within Aerojet Rocketdyne uh, in the 2015 timeframe. We uh, shut a couple of plants down in California, Gaines, uh, Gainesville, Virginia, and we relocated product lines to Camden, Arkansas. And so we stood up some brand new buildings for some of the product lines that you see mentioned up there. And then we also decided as a result of shutting down our Sacramento facility, which was our largest facility, uh, facility which produced large solid rocket motors. And we started migrating a lot of that work to the Camden, Arkansas area with plans to grow even more into that market. Um, so if you look at the pictures, it gives you just a visual of what some of the buildings looked like back in the day. And then the picture that you see on the right hand side is uh, what we refer to as our large solid rocket motor casting chamber. The picture does not do it justice. Um, so just a little bit about uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne related to uh, the Camden site history. Thank you for jumping ahead to my next question. <laughs> you're, all, you're all off script. That's really right. helpful. We're already uh, we are. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so you've talked a little bit about Aerojet. Uh, is there anything that you would like to add, Chandra, when it comes to the products that you're manufacturing down there, the relationship with Lockheed Martin, and the role that Aerojet's uh, playing on the, on the world stage when it comes to defending our interests? Yeah, so um, Aerojet Rocketdyne employs over 1,100 employees at our Camden, Arkansas location. So if you refer back to the slide that we just looked at, for nearly 45 years, starting in 1979, that's when our talented Camden team started to develop and produce um, rocket motor capabilities. Um, so they started it back during that time frame. If I look at uh, just you know what we do there, we are part of helping to provide um, protection for our warfighters as well as our nation and our allies. And so we're very proud of that. And I would tell you personally, for me, that's the, one of the reasons why I'm with Aerojet because of what Aerojet does. Uh, from a company standpoint, uh, we are considered the solid rocket motor center of excellence for Aerojet, and we produce over 75,000 motors, solid rocket motors a year. And so that's just to give you a magnitude of what we do without getting into a lot of detail of what we do. <laughs> Can we go back to the pre, the, the, I guess two slides back? And, um, James Lee, we are, again, not getting into specifics, but with the brands that are listed here, and John, if you want to jump in too, um, there is an enormous representation of the aer aerospace and defense industries that are in the um, in, uh, Highland Industrial Park. Would you just give a paint the picture of those players that are in that space? You can, since y'all are off script, so am I. So. <laughs> Well, obviously you see there by the listing, this is a, a, a partial listing of, of the, the tenants in Highland Industrial Park. Everyone's familiar with Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics, Aerojet Rocketdyne, Raytheon Technologies. Those, those are what we refer to as the four uh, biggies, but there's several other smaller uh, defense uh, uh, subcontractors such as Spectra Technologies, Armtech Defense Systems, uh, NTS, and and, and others that, that aren't shown there. So uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's been fairly well reported. Uh, I'm, I'm not telling any trade secrets here talking about HIMARS because HIMARS has been in the news uh, so much lately, but uh, that is, uh, that is a, a, a product line that is being built uh, in, in Camden at, at Lockheed. Uh, that, that's no secret uh, and they, they've had a history uh, starting with the multiple launch rocket system, as Chandra mentioned, I believe in 79 or 80, uh, about that time frame is when that was brought to Camden. Um, that was a very successful uh, multiple launch rocket system uh, that was produced uh, by a predecessor to Lockheed, which is now Lockheed. But uh, uh, those, those are some of the things, you know, Javelin missiles, Stinger missiles, et cetera, et cetera, um, Chandra's company 
is a subcontractor on, on a lot of those product lines. But uh, so basically some of the most uh, sophisticated uh, defensive uh, um, missile systems, uh, I would say literally in the world, are being produced uh, right here in, in, in the Camden, Arkansas Highland Industrial Park. Anything more from you? Great, thank you. Um, okay, let's talk about the recent announcements that have come, um, continuing to be an active investment in Camden and the companies there. One of the biggest announcements came at the 2019 Paris Air Show, where Lockheed announced a $142 million investment. Uh, James Lee, what is it about Camden and that area that generates continued investment by these organizations uh, and the government? I, I think it is, it's based, you know, really uh, uh, about our heritage and our history. Uh, Camden's a very patriotic town, and all of our workers that are employed in the aerospace and defense industry um, believe in, in, in the work that they do and, and as Chandra said, me, uh, defending our war fighters and, and helping to, to, to keep, keep the peace around the world. Um, I, I've worked closely uh, through the State uh, Arkansas Economic Development Commission, the governor's office with uh, both Aerojet and Lockheed on recent expansions that both of those companies um, have announced. And, uh, as mentioned, uh, the, one of the most recent was uh, Lockheed Martin. Governor Hutchinson at the time announced the, uh, uh, the expansion of Lockheed Martin at the Paris Air Show in 2019, uh, $142 million in investment in new buildings and equipment and about 326 jobs. Both Airjet and Lockheed in Camden employed well over 1,000 uh, individuals uh, with probably more to come. I think that's safe to say. Um, and and uh, so the, the reason uh, I think that the government uh, and the, the Pentagon and Defense Department continues to contract with a lot of the companies that are located there is, is our track record and our history and our heritage. And um, we, uh, the, a lot of the systems that have been produced have been built uh, uh, on budget or under budget and, and on, on time. So I think that's one of the reasons that that we get a hard look anytime there's there's additional programs or contracts coming down the line. Uh, Chandra, a $216 million investment was recently announced mm -hmm. to go into the area, uh, announced by the Pentagon and the Department of Defense regarding uh, that money going to Aerojet facilities in Arkansas. Would you uh, share with us what that might be applied to uh, at the facilities. Yes, yeah, so uh, I don't know if you all have uh, had opportunity to take a look at the April release that came out from the DOD. And so that money is gonna go towards um, advancing our manufacturing processes, consolidating product lines, as well as helping to increase the production as well as the speed of delivery of the Javelin product line the Stinger product line, and then the guided product line, which stands for guided multiple launch rocket systems. Um, all of that money is not necessarily going to come to the Camden, Arkansas facility, so that money is going to be used for Aerojet Rocketdyne as an enterprise. Uh, a good portion of it will be uh, spent in Camden, so we're going to build buildings and do a lot of upgrades, and it's going to be spread across the Camden, Arkansas site, as well as the Huntsville, Alabama, and the Orange County, Virginia sites. John, you've been quiet, so why don't you tell us who your best tenant is? Well, so Air, Air, Air Air <laughs> <laughs> I was going to get on him because I, I didn't notice me at Easy, the top. Yeah. I, lo I noticed Lockheed Martin at the top. I we'll have to work out. on that. Yeah. <laughs> Those are no. no order at all. <laughs> to, pr to protect the innocent, uh, it's my fault. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Andrew, for taking that up for John. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's talk about the people. Uh, we're we're going to go totally off script. I'm not going to ask about rockets or anything else in particular, but over the, the time I've spent at the chamber, there has always been a few places in the state that have really done well as a region to help capitalize on assets that exist, namely people, and then also other types of resources. This is one of them. The Golden Triangle has, seems to always have history of working together. So whoever wants to pick up the mic and speak into it first, how have y'all done that, and how does that... 
How do folks in like central Arkansas capitalize on what you do there to, uh, to help stimulate activity here? I'm gonna give that to you. <laughs> I've only been there a year, so. <laughs> But, but, John, you, but you drew me there. <laughs> John, John, and John and Chandra are relatively new, newbies. I'm, I'm, an, I'm the old timer. I'm, I'm a native of Camden. Lived there all my life. And so, uh, you know, Highland Industrial Park draws employees from about a 75 mile radius uh, from the park. Um, so we have people commuting uh, to Highland Industrial Park for these good paying jobs um, to to work there. And I think uh, one of our challenges is we've got to develop, John and I have had multiple uh, meetings about new housing uh, possibilities for our area. And um, so that's, uh, that's something that, that we're addressing and, and working on. Uh, we, we love for people to, to commute, but we want them to, to come down and work and, and stay in, in our area. So that's, that's something that, uh, that we're working on and, and uh, will, will be further developed. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, part of what we have, too, is just the infrastructure that was put in during World War II to be able to manufacture ordinances. That's still the draw, at least for us, as part of the Golden Triangle. There's other excellence in Magnolia and El Dorado, but for us, it's, you know, really the defense industry. Um, you know, 19,000 acres, 5.5 million square foot of buildings. It gives us space to do what we need to do safely, and that's something that, you know, as they're designing these new projects out there they need a lot of space so they can do things safely uh, you don't you don't fly over these sites and see million square foot buildings out there you see a whole lot of 10,000 square foot buildings or 5,000 square foot buildings that it takes to do the certain processes so having that space and then having infrastructure in place you know we've got Highland operates the water and the wastewater system in the park so when they need to build and they need to build right away to implement these programs there's not a lot of red tape and approvals and processes. They work directly with the Department of Defense and they design their programs, get them approved, and then they're off and running. And, and we're able to stay out of their way while they do that. So I think that helps these companies want to be there. Shandra, your team has, uh, some of those folks have been there for their entire careers. What's the next 10 years look like from a workforce standpoint for Aerojet? So as I've already mentioned, we have over 1,100 employees right now. So if I go back seven years, um, the Aerojet Rocket Island Camden site has grown more than 80%, and we're still growing. And so that takes you down into the low 100s uh, compared to 1,100 right now. So when I look at um, you know what we're looking to do, uh, just based on some of the feedback that uh, John uh, gave you, is we're looking to grow. Uh, the money that we're getting from the DOD is going to help us grow and get those products out uh, at a faster speed. And so with that, uh, we have a lot of opportunities. I'm going to refer you all to rocket.com forward slash careers <laughs> so that you can look to see uh, all the different positions that we're looking for. Uh, but we're looking for highly technical uh, engineers as well as skilled labor. And if we do not have, you know, people that have manufacturing experience, then we're looking for people who have uh, the ability to pass the career readiness assessment uh, with a silver rating or higher. And so uh, from that standpoint, we're looking to grow about a couple of hundred more uh, for the Camden Aerojet Rocket Island location. And before turning it to the, the, the room for questions, are there any other top secret things you'd like to share with us? <laughs> the last slide. I just wanted to put that slide up there so you guys could look at the scale of the park. Um, the greenfield sites that I mentioned are the ones highlighted in green that we're trying to you know, make sure that the tenants are aware that they've got room to grow and bring more operations there. And if you look to the left of that, you'll see the, the little orange square of East Camden. Um, that's where we're working to do some housing projects now and looking for other quality of life type projects. You know, we want to be able to have tra walking trails and shops and restaurants and, and housing options. So that way, as Chandra's trying to recruit people to the area, they've got a place that they could see, hey, this is you know somewhere we'd want to live and work and bring our families here. So it's it's going to be a lot of work. It's going to take us a lot of time. But we're, uh, we're, we're in the dreaming phase right now, kind of turning over stones and, and getting ready to go to work on all of those projects. 
I would just like to mention that, that it really is uh, uh, my organization's Washtenaw Partnership for Economic Development. We refer to ourselves as Team Camden, but it's really a team effort. Uh, John uh, is on my board of directors. Uh, he's one of my bosses. Uh, I work very closely with, with John and Highland Park Management. Uh, we work very closely uh, uh, with, with all of our defense industries. Chandra's company, Aerojet, does a lot of training uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, in my offices, we have a, um, a, a training room that, that, that they utilize, and, and we're happy to do that for them because they're one of our partners. And, and we're very proud of our aerospace and defense industry, and it really is a team effort. And the only other thing that I would add is that picture doesn't necessarily do it justice until you actually come down to Camden and actually see the industrial park and tour some of the... Uh, defense industry company. So you're looking at that, Aerojet has about 2,000 of the 68,000 acres that I showed you on that previous slide. And we're spread out over 150 buildings plus, not including the bunkers. And it's just amazing what the team down there does. How, how easy is it for a community member to be able to organize or make a, re a request for a tour of the facilities down there? Just call us up. <laughs> There you have it. It's, it's, it's just that easy. Just call us up. And it's a matter of making sure that, you know, we have the space and the time. Uh, we will definitely make time. But you can only imagine with the DOD and that $215.6 million that they've given us, we're getting a lot of attention. <laughs> so you may have to wait a couple of weeks in order to get in there. But it's simple as just call us up and, and say you want to take a tour. Questions? Madam President-elect. Denver wants me to repeat the question with everything but the reference to Alabama. <laughs> take, take them out on, on a trivia night to the Native Dog Brewery downtown and maybe they'll enjoy themselves and hang out. Denver, I'll, get, I'll repeat the next one. I was listening to you and not paying attention to the question. I... So, no, I, I think that's the key is figuring out that quality of life and it's gonna be developing new neighborhoods. It's been 20 years since the neighborhood was built. And as we're looking at housing, we could do, you know, a wide range from RV parks up to, you know, single family rentals. So, you know, a lot of these guys don't want to own their homes now. They just want a neighborhood where everything's taken care of. And so we're looking at all those different options on housing. And there's going to be, you know, several different uh, types of housing that we have to address. But with that, we have to bring some amenities that, that they look for. Uh, and, and that's, you know, quality of life and being outside and being active, I think's the, the big target there. But it's still hard to convince them not to want to still live here in Little Rock and drive an hour and a half. And, and we do have people that are doing that. They're driving from Hot Springs and Little Rock to, to work every day down there. So. Camden's a typical, you know, small town uh, life. And, and uh, uh, that doesn't mean that, that we haven't had people locate from Virginia and California that that after they got over the initial culture shock of, of moving from a, a, a big metropolis, I'm not going to name any names here, but, uh, but, but to a, a, a smaller town and a slower pace of life, uh, we find that, that a lot of people, once they get settled in, they wouldn't trade it for the world. And uh, that's, that's all I can say on that. Yeah, and the other thing that I would suggest is that they get internships uh, just so that they can get the experience of, you know, working for a defense or aerospace company as well as, you know, being in a small town. And I think once we get them in there, we can convince them to come back because, I mean, with the things that we do as a company, uh, all of the, uh, you know, companies in the industrial park, the after work activities, uh, you know, some of the extracurriculars that's offered through not only the city of Camden, but El Dorado and Magnolia, I think that attracts, you know, uh, younger people as well as myself who came from a big city um, to, you know, an area like that. So, and then the other thing for me was the crime. So, 
crime is almost non-existent when I compare that to a Richmond, Virginia. There was another, yes sir. <laughs> the question is, would Shandra ride a rocket if... <laughs> so the best I could probably do is allow you to witness us testing a rocket motor. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> you've seen the YouTube, but it's nothing like seeing it in person. Yeah, it's kind of loud, isn't it, Chandra? Yeah, it's very loud. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. So um, the stinger. He wants to know which munitions and, and applications are actively in use today in the Ukraine war. Yes, yeah, so for the Aerojet Rocketdyne facility, uh, it's the Stinger. So we make the uh, solid rocket motor for the Stinger uh, system. Uh, Javelin, as well as Guided, uh, which stands for uh, Guided Multiple Launch Rocket System. So those three which is, if I take you back to the DOD and what they're funding, they're funding around those three product lines. And so we do all three of those product lines in Camden at Aerojet. And it's been widely reported, the, the high Mars system uh, that's produced in Camden. And that's Lockheed. Lockheed Martin. What's, what's the representation of the national or international footprint of the rocket, uh, solid rocket system development that takes place in Arkansas? Um, I can't really get into a lot of detail okay. on that one. <laughs> Why did you ask me a question that I just to that on, Andrew? <laughs> Anybody else? So for what we do, so we do solid propulsion, so rocket motors, uh, depending on which ones we are manufacturing, they may go next door to Lockheed Martin. Uh, they may go to a different Lockheed Martin uh, facility. So what we do is not the final product. It's a portion of the final product. So their, their customer is the Department of, of Defense, and like Chandra says, it, <coughs> it, it may go to a, another facility in Camden, but, but once it's, so the, the finished product is basically signed off and purchased by the government, then it's shipped out to, to whatever military installation it goes to. I can think of, so we have about 26 product lines in the Camden site. I think one of them goes directly to the government. All the rest of them go to our customers who add whatever they're gonna add and turn it into a missile. Jim. Jerry. Yes. Yep. So that's public. It's manufactured by mm -hmm. 
Don't, don't get me uh, scared looking behind my back asking that question you just asked. <laughs> the, the question was, are, are, when you're in the area, are you viewing the use of the launch system? Is that correct? Yeah, they got it. Yes, they do. Yeah, so it's the guided multiple launch rocket system. Yeah, what you see on TV is, it's frequently viewed as that rocket system, mm -hmm. launch system. Yes. Uh, I think Denver is waving us off. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panelists. And I'd Thanks so much for everyone being here. Again, uh, appreciate all you do. And uh, y'all hang tight for a second. I'm gonna give you a little speaker gift, but obviously yesterday was Memorial Day. And so we're grateful for the work uh, that they do and for all those who serve our country and have died on behalf of US uh, interest around the world. We're very grateful for all that you're doing to help protect our country. Um, Andrew, Chandra, John, and James, I do have speaker gifts for you uh, as part of our speaker series this year uh, by books by Little Rock Connected Authors. It's part of our literacy initiative. Hang tight, I'll give these out to you afterwards. Uh, but your name will be in a list of these books that we give away to our Little Rock School District resource centers and libraries uh, at the end of this fiscal year. Uh, I do have a, a little fun connection to Canvin. I was an uh, intern in Senator David Pryor's office back way, way, way long time ago and appreciate it. I'm sure uh, Senator David Pryor had a little bit to do with some of the success that you guys are seeing here in Camden and grateful for the family and the opportunity to serve in his office many, many moons ago. Michael Teague served for his son as well, uh, Mark Pryor. So grateful to all of you for being here. Next week, we honor the Little Rock Nine with the inaugural La Petite Roche Global Service Award. Reservations are required. Don't miss it. And with that, we are adjourned.